revving up a revolution. Believers banking on electric vehicles drive full throttle to get more of them on the road. Really what matters is, are we making a difference in the world? Until we see every car on the road uh, being electric, uh, you know, we will not stop. A new documentary with extraordinary behind the scenes access tracks the EV's highs and lows, and so do we. It takes a lot of capital to start a car company and to engineer and validate a vehicle design. It's not a cheap activity. Many electric vehicle startups hit the skids, but that may be about to change. We talked to one of the men banking on Tesla. Plus, nanoscale research that could fuel a quantum leap for EVs, the next generation of batteries that could drive the industry and help make the electric vehicle the car of the future. This is Energy Now. Hello, I'm Thalia Shuris. Welcome to Energy Now, a weekly look at America's energy challenges and what we're doing about them. One of the biggest challenges is just keeping people and goods moving. Almost 30% of the energy we use is for transportation and almost all of that comes from oil. And we import about half that oil to the tune of about $300 billion a year and making America less secure because we depend on so many other nations for our energy. So the U.S. government and many private companies are working on a whole host of ways to get us off our dependence on oil. There are alternatives. Biofuels made from plants, compressed and liquefied natural gas, hydrogen and more. But another alternative, electricity, has been getting most of the attention from Washington. We set a goal of having one million electric vehicles on our roads by 2015. To Hollywood. This is the future and it's attainable. By one estimate, there could be more than 600,000 EVs on the road by 2014, putting the president's million EV goal within reach. Even so, that would be a tiny fraction of the roughly 140 million passenger cars currently on U.S. roads. There are now about half a dozen models available, and next year at least five more new EV models are expected to hit showrooms. Chevrolet will produce an all-electric version of the Spark Mini car. EVs aren't cheap, priced from about $32,000 to $120,000. But there's a $7,500 federal tax credit to bring the price closer to comparable gasoline-fueled cars. And power companies say EVs are cheaper to run, about one-fifth the cost of filling up with gasoline. The EPA says cars like the Nissan Leaf and Chevy Volt are about half as carbon intensive as gasoline models, but they're not zero emission vehicles since most of the nation's electricity that's needed to charge the EV's battery still comes from fossil fuels. And there's still so-called range anxiety. While most EVs travel 100 miles or less on a single battery charge, cheaper gasoline-fueled cars can go 400 miles or more on a single tank. Consulting firm Deloitte recently found just 20% of U.S. drivers would consider buying an electric vehicle with a 100-mile range. You just saw some scenes from the new documentary, The Revenge of the Electric Car, opening this weekend in New York and Los Angeles. It's an inside look at the rebirth of the electric car. More on the movie a little later, including an interview with its director, Chris Payne. But with the movie coming out, we wondered whether the U.S. is on the cusp of an electric vehicle revolution, or could the entire EV industry run out of juice? And we went looking for some answers at electric car maker Tesla, which recently opened a new factory in California's Silicon Valley and is one of the companies featured in Revenge. Lee Patrick Sullivan has more in this Energy Now Spotlight. It's show and tell at the Tesla factory in Fremont, California, as the electric vehicle maker unveils its newest car, the Model S. This is the first car that will have over 300 miles of electric range. Okay. So that's, you know, this, it's breaking new ground and it's getting the range to a place that's directly comparable with gasoline cars. Tesla co-founder J.B. Straubel shows off the luxury sedan, which sells for about $50,000, and that's after the $7,500 tax credit. That price gets you a battery with about a 160-mile range. The 300-mile model costs about $20,000 more. This little door actually flips open. It's Tesla's second vehicle after the more than $100,000 Roadster. But the Model S is the first to be built in the massive Tesla factory. 
This place is the size of 88 football fields and has the auto industry's only indoor test track. To revamp this former Toyota assembly plant into an all-electric vehicle factory, Tesla received about $400 million in low-interest loans from the U.S. Department of Energy. How tough is it to start an, uh, a car company from scratch, especially one that's not traditional? Um, extremely hard. <laughs> you know, there's uh, no question about that. It's an extremely hard activity. Um, you know, the, the tooling required, the investment, the, the years of engineering and validation testing, it's, it's all very, very difficult. How difficult? Well, in the past year, it's been a less than electric ride for independent EV companies. Fisker Automotive had several delays in the release of its extended range EV. Modec, a British electric truck maker, has declared bankruptcy, as has Indiana-based Think Automotive. And auto giants like General Motors and Nissan, which are starting to move into electric vehicles, are also off to a slow start. They've sold less than half as many Chevy Volts and Nissan Leafs than the companies predicted. Then there's the story of California-based green vehicles. It's a three-wheel vehicle and it's an electric vehicle. That's the company's president, Mike Ryan, being interviewed at the Detroit Auto Show by Gizmag.com. The maker of the three-wheeled electric commuter car was looking for a home base to build its factory. Enter Salinas, California. Uh, their idea was to basically uh, incubate, if you will, uh, a new kind of industry and hopefully pulling some, uh, some uh, business down from the Silicon Valley into the Salinas Valley. Yeah. Jeff Mitchell yes. covered the story for the Salinas Californian. The city of Salinas agreed to loan Green Vehicles $535,000 to build its EVs there. We had, uh, we had these, uh, these cool little electric cars running around town for a while. Uh, there was a lot of hoopla around it, and uh, I, think, uh, I think people were very excited at the idea that there was going to be uh, uh, some jobs. But the jobs never came. There were no green vehicles built in Salinas, and seven months after getting the money from the town, green vehicles declared bankruptcy. This nondescript warehouse is listed as green vehicles Salinas location, but there's no one here and nothing left behind but a couple moving vans and one green vehicle. Mitchell doesn't think the city will ever see that money yeah. again and worries this will make city leaders gun shy about investing in companies in the future. I think it was a very noble effort by the city to support uh, this startup. Um, the question is, is really whether at the end of the day um, the city did all of its due diligence in supporting the company. And Tesla had its challenges as well. Despite selling 1,800 of its Roadster model, the company was running on fumes until the Department of Energy loans came through. It then raised another $600 million in private capital to get the Model S to the finish line. What was that boardroom like? Well, it's, uh, I mean, it, it's tense. You know, it takes a lot of capital to start a car company and to engineer and validate a vehicle design. It's not a cheap activity. So I think uh, you know, key to that was demonstrating progress along, at, at milestones along the way. Um, you know, it's not you know, simply enough just to say, trust us, and, and you know, we'll get to the end. We have to show that you know, progress is there at every step. With Tesla's hefty price tags, some Republican members of Congress criticized the Obama administration for loaning money to a company that makes cars for rich people. Straubel says Tesla's cars are expensive <laughs> because electric vehicle technology is expensive but he says the company is working to bring prices down. Do you see a day when Tesla will have a $25,000 car? Absolutely. Um, you know, our, our vision is to drive down the price of electric vehicles and the technology that makes them possible just relentlessly. Everything we're doing internally is reducing the cost of battery packs, reducing the cost of motors. Next year, there will be even more EVs hitting showrooms. Ford will have the Focus EV and expect EVs from smart car and mini. And with all the established automakers joining the EV market, Straubel says the door may be closing on EV startups. As the industry matures and as more mainstream automakers get into building EVs, you know, the barrier to new companies starting from scratch is going up. And uh, you know, it's, uh, people you know, look at, at Tesla and it's you know, kind of blazing a pathway for a startup uh, car company, um, but it has not been an easy pathway. Tesla's next vehicle will be called Model X and it will be an all-electric SUV. And as of now, the company says it will not be applying for any more government loans. 
In Fremont, California, Lee Patrick Sullivan, Energy Now. The well-established automakers are competing with Tesla, but they're also collaborating with the newcomer. Tesla currently makes battery packs and chargers for Daimler AG's smart car and Mercedes brands, and it's going to make the motor for Toyota's still-to-come electric RAV4 SUV. Tesla employs more than a thousand people in the U.S. and is expanding. Still to come, what do the world's first computer hard drive and grocery store barcodes have to do with electric vehicles? Find out when we launch the Energy Now Innovation Series. But first, EVs are getting their revenge on the big screen with help from a big booster. Now's when we hope they can get a foothold so that they can expand and become a bigger part of the market over the next 20 years. Inside documentary director Chris Payne's world when we come back. Energy Now is celebrating its first anniversary. Thanks to you, our show now reaches over 150,000 TV and web viewers every week. From Washington to Beijing, from Houston to Tel Aviv, we tell you about new energy jobs, breakthrough technologies, climate action, and how to cut back America's dangerous reliance on foreign oil, which is costing our economy roughly $300 billion a year. We've got to get on our own resources. When are we going to make this jump? But the in-depth reports you see on Energy Now also have a price tag. So to keep Energy Now growing, we want to form new partnerships with foundations and corporations who are equally concerned about America's energy future. What we do right here has a direct impact on what happens here. Join us in bringing Energy Now's message to more and more viewers. Please have your company or foundation contact us today. Much of the modern history of the electric vehicle has been captured on film by environmentalist, documentary filmmaker and full-time EV fan Chris Payne. Five years ago, Who Killed the Electric Car accused U.S. automakers, primarily General Motors, of crushing EV development in the 1990s, figuratively and literally, by declaring electrics like GM's EV1 unprofitable and stifling battery development. Payne even staged a mock funeral for the electric car to make his point. Now, the EV is back, and so is Chris Payne with a new movie. For this one, Payne had unprecedented access to auto titans, yes, including GM. I spent some time with Payne to talk about his new documentary and to get his take on the future of the EV. There's a degree of excitement around electric vehicles we hadn't seen before. Chris Payne's EV Act Two is Revenge of the Electric Car a title that suggests continued bad blood between automakers and environmentalists clamoring for clean cars. Far from it. Instead, former General Motors Vice Chairman Bob Lutz. We're going to have to get the lithium ion technology together. Nissan's Chairman and CEO Carlos Ghosn. I don't want to wake up competition. And Elon Musk, PayPal founder and now the driving force behind high-end all-electric Tesla. You know, until we see every car on the road uh, being electric, we will not stop. Opened their boardrooms and homes to Payne's cameras for three years, starting in 2008. We want to make this technology and electric cars uh, affordable to as many people as possible. The time frame mirrors U.S. consumers' recent slow shift to hybrids and plug-ins as gas prices continue to fluctuate. Here's Bob Lutz. He doesn't believe in global warming. He's a car guy. It's not that he's an environmentalist. He, he wants to make the EV work. Why? Well, because the core reason of the electric car has nothing to do with the environment. It has to do with not importing oil. So if you're like a real American, like Bob Lutz, you know, has a certain kind of classic Americanness about him. It's about keeping energy, energy, money here. So um, I think Bob understands that if we can power these things off of the electrical grid instead of Middle East oil, that's a good thing. Payne says EVs are a U-turn for auto executives keen on capitalizing on a market in the making. Take Nissan Leafs champion Carlos Ghosn. Carlos is also not an environmentalist. He doesn't wear that on his badge. Um, he's about the spreadsheet and the numbers. Carlos in our film makes a, you know, sort of an unguarded comment in a, in a car. The public is expecting this from us. It's expecting this from us. It's expecting that car manufacturers step up. They're expecting car makers to step up and provide 
cars that are more responsible in terms of its use of petrol and the environment. Talk about stepping up. Hi. Hi. I'm Tanya. Oh, welcome. Payne himself not only owns a trio of EVs, more about that in a minute, his eggs come from a backyard roost near a garden with a composter. His remodeled 1950s era house overlooking Los Angeles boasts kitchen cabinets of bamboo and energy efficient appliances. An eco flaw though, plastic which comes from petroleum protects valuable fossils embedded in the countertops. True. Uh oh, you well, just busted your philosophy. Oh hell, I'm, I'm <laughs> hardly a purist. We use lots of oil here. Hot water and electricity are provided 100% in the summer, he says 60% in the winter, by rooftop solar systems. These panels here power the entire house and all the uh, electric cars in the garage. Payne's lifestyle came largely from growing up in an outdoorsy family, conscious about the way they were living, he says. There's a lot of messages I got when I was growing up that maybe like a little bit of environmental awareness was a good idea. And uh, then in 1995, I drove this uh, General Motors EV1. I thought, wow, this is really a better car. Fast forward 15 years and we hit 60 miles an hour in less than four seconds in Payne's Tesla Roadster. At about $120,000 a pop, the Roadster isn't for the average driver. And anyway, it's no longer in production. The new Model S is still pricey at about 50 grand, even after a $7,500 federal tax credit. But Payne argues other brands are affordable. Uh, the Leaf is $32,000, mm -hmm. and there's a $7,500 tax credit. And in California, there was $2,500 to $5,000. So the Leaf we have, and I paid full retail price for it, I ended up costing about $24,000. Payne also dismisses range anxiety, that fear of running out of juice. He points to GM's strategy in designing the plug-in hybrid Chevy Volt, the first 35 miles or so on battery power, long distances dependent only on gas stations. So that means it never runs out of juice because you always put in gasoline if you want to go further. So I think Things like range anxiety are part of the, the myth that's pushing back on this. And what does Payne think about zero emission claims from some EV companies, even though most of the electricity to run their cars comes from fossil fueled power plants? If the issue is the word zero emissions, that's the ideal of what they can be if you have solar power. But I think the fact that you're guaranteed 50% less emissions is, you know, 100% improvement. So the bottom line is, Payne is an unabashed EV booster. But will the electric car's revenge be fleeting without continued government support? You have to have the government leading this. You know, the car industry is not like making an iPhone that's you know, a $200 appliance that you could probably, you're talking about $20,000, $50,000 industrial machinery that's trying to break into a monopoly industry that's a hundred years old. You've got to incent um, this technology or it won't happen. Chris Payne has answers for just about everything to do with electric vehicles, including where to plug them in when you park on the street. He says, look to Europe, where companies like Siemens AG are building parking meters that double as EV charging stations. When we come back, charging into the future. A look at how one company with a big background in innovation is now working on a battery technology that could revolutionize the electric vehicle. Clean energy is a top priority with consumers and politicians across this country and throughout Maryland. And now there's an easy way to learn how clean energy can be a part of your life, in your home, at work, as a career. The Maryland Clean Energy Summit is your chance to get all the information you want, from solar and wind to thermostats and energy suppliers. The state's foremost clean energy leaders will be presenting at this Hallmark Conference, so don't miss it. Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back. Earlier, we told you about range anxiety, that fear of EV batteries running out of juice while you're on the road. 
Well, there's one well-known company you might not expect to be involved in electric vehicles, and it's developing new battery technology that could eliminate range anxiety. That innovation is the first in a new segment we're introducing on innovations and innovators in clean energy technology. So here's Josh Zepps on the development of a super long-range car battery and the company leading the charge. It tells you something about how fast electric vehicle technology is moving that I'm driving to report on the future of electric cars and this is the first time I've ever even driven one. It also tells you something about how fast electric vehicle technology is moving that in order to get from my hotel to the interview 45 miles away and back I need to get a ride with my camera operator because the fully charged battery won't make it. To gaze into the future of a battery that won't quit I drove to IBM and its Almaden Research Center in San Jose, California to meet nuclear physicist Winfried Wilker. There's been a long history of IBM doing completely new things like building computers was very far away from the original things they did like punch cards or cheese slices. <laughs> <laughs> the famed IBM cheese, cheese slicer. slicer yeah. precisely. <laughs> in addition to the cheese slicer, IBM invented the floppy disk, the personal computer, the barcode, and... World's first hard drive. It's impressive. You should have seen the size of the laptop. IBM has created a lot of things in its time. And now... Most people on the planet want to own a car. I think it's not going to change the way. So people... Can they? <laughs> not if we continue with oil. So Wilker is working on a battery he hopes could be 10 times more energy dense than the best batteries today and could power a car for 500 miles on a single charge. Let's put that in perspective. According to the EPA, Nissan's all-electric car, the LEAF, has a range of 73 miles. So if you live, say, in Detroit, a single charge will get you to Flint. But a 500-mile battery would get you to Toledo, Ohio, and on to Cleveland, then Pittsburgh, and just about to Washington, D.C., without having to stop once to plug it in. Using electricity instead of gasoline could cut U.S. oil consumption and make America less dependent on imported energy. So if the 500-mile battery succeeds, and that is still a big if, how would the technology actually work? Let's start with conventional lithium-ion batteries, the kind used in cell phones, laptops, and today's electric cars. These batteries contain lithium and include heavy metal oxides, like cobalt oxide or manganese oxide, which makes them bulky and heavy. Lithium shuttles between a graphite anode and a metal oxide cathode as the battery is charged or discharged. A lithium air battery is different because it doesn't carry around all the chemicals it needs to work. Instead, when it releases electricity, the battery borrows oxygen from the surrounding air to form lithium oxide. And when the battery is plugged in for recharging, it gives that oxygen back. That saves both space and mass meaning a lighter battery that can store much more energy per pound. Well, the reason we're using lithium, it's a metal that is very, very light. Sally Swanson is a researcher on the IBM 500 team. One of the project's big challenges is working with a metal as volatile as lithium. It reacts with the nitrogen in the air in the presence of water. It reacts with CO2 in the air. <laughs> and of course it reacts with oxygen, which is what we're going to use and the air for is, our batteries. And the air is pretty much CO2 CO2, and oxygen, oxygen, and oxygen and nitrogen. nitrogen. So yes. you're saying it reacts with everything. Yeah, we have a challenge in we're going to have to figure out a way to get those things away from our batteries. Right. Swanson demonstrates what happens to lithium when it gets wet. So this is just well, water that you're about this to... This is just water, and I just... Whoa. What gas is that coming off? That is hydrogen coming okay. off. And yeah. it's just gone? And it's gone. Okay, yeah. so you don't want that happening. No, but you notice there wasn't a flame, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> so your car won't explode, no, it just won't yeah. work. The second way in which the lithium air gets its weight down is by ditching something that other batteries have, heavy metal oxide cathodes. Instead, the IBM team is trying to nano-engineer a super lightweight carbon cathode. Now it's time for the IBM cookie bake-off. <laughs> Luckily for the team, when it comes to designing microscopic things, there's more than a little institutional experience at the company that developed the microchip. Why is it necessary to, to nano-engineer the carbon? Well, um, surface area is 
we found has been critical. We've looked at a lot of different carbons, and one of the things that we found is that if we have a high surface area carbon, then we can get much more capacity. Winfried Wilker is the first to admit the lithium air project is a complicated gamble. But the prospect of an electric car engine with the same size, weight, price, range and performance of a gasoline engine is a prize too big to resist. So a high-tech company really should, and it has an obligation nearly, to help the environment and the world. Do, so do you see what you're doing as, as a larger mission than just a job? Absolutely, hey, <laughs> yes. If Wilker's bet pays off, then in 50 years' time, the idea of IBM as a computer company might just be as out of date as the idea of IBM as a cheese slicer company is today. In San Jose, California, Josh Zepps, Energy Now. IBM hopes to start commercial production of the long-range battery by 2020, and Big Blue just gained another title. Newsweek named it the greenest company in America. Rounding out the top five, Hewlett Packard, Sprint Nextel, Baxter Healthcare, and Dell. Some Americans are actually just fine with the range of today's electric vehicles and are proud to show their EVs off. That's what's in this week's Energy Now Hot Zone. No oil, no gas, no sound. It's a beautiful day. EV lovers joined together for National Plug-in Day in 26 cities last weekend, including Santa Monica, California, where drivers paraded Fisker Automotive's luxury Karma, Coda's more compact sedan, and what looked like a Batmobile. A big standout, though, was this delivery truck whose driver said it gets about 100 miles per charge. The debate last week on Energy Now between authors Amanda Little and Robert Bryce on whether America can compete in the global energy race got a lot of comments on our website and Facebook page. Monica Dalvey from Atlanta wrote, the price paid for fossil fuel energies never includes the actual cost to the environment. If the price for fossil fuels took into consideration those costs, then there would be no need for subsidies for renewable energies. And regarding government subsidies for any business, Steve Callahan wrote, How many times must it be said, the government should not be in the business of trying to pick winners and losers in any business? And that includes energy. We love getting your comments, so reach out to us on YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter. Search for us at Energy Now News. And read our blogs and watch extras on our website at energynow.com. That's it for this week's Energy Now. I'm Thalia Shuris. See you next week. Next week on Energy Now, garbage trucks that run on the trash they collect, plastic made from sewage, not oil, and how you can continue being green even after you die. Help us make Energy Now a continuing success in our second year. To keep growing, we want to form new partnerships with foundations and corporations who are equally concerned about America's energy future. Join us in bringing our message to more and more viewers. Please have your company or foundation contact Energy Now.